And I feel that we are increasingly making little boys feel ashamed of who they are. I'm starting to think that the psychiatric community needs to include feminism in their big compendium of mental disorders. And I feel that we are increasingly making little boys feel ashamed of who they are. In many classrooms, as a colleague of mine has said, increasingly elementary schools, junior high schools, and even high schools are run by women for girls. Boys are there on sufferance. Där vill genusforskarna ha in 50% män i förskolan bland personalen. Och det vill ju svenska genusforskare också. Men då, då kritiserade svenska genusforskare att norska, belgiska och, och de skotska genusforskarna ville av fel skäl. Nämligen att män hade något att, e att tillföra egenskap av män. Det handlar ju alltid om, när man pratar om genusforskning och annat, att få fram just problematiken kring kvinnor. Att vi är jobbigt, vi är utsatta. Så att redan innan man, man börjar forska så har man ju bestämt sig för att det är kvinnorna som är drabbade. Boys growing up today don't know what's going on behind the scenes. All they know is that they're frustrated, they're being smashed down, they're being told that what they have to offer is not needed. Very popular storybook is the tale of two giraffes who are sad to be childless until they come across an abandoned crocodile egg. I've read this book and I can tell you it's a beautiful story. The crocodile grows up and realizes he could not be blessed with two more loving or delicious parents. <laughs> Obviously, there's a shortage of this kind of literature, so I've come up with my own set of children's books based on the classic favorites. Instead of the cat in the hat comes back, I've gone for the cat in the hat comes out. Um, we've also got the Fox in Socks, which is now the Fox in Docks. And uh, my personal favourite, Green Eggs and Ham, is now Green Eggs and Wham. <laughs> yeah. The school's director, the school's director says yes, there are biological differences between boys and girls, but that doesn't mean they can't have the same interests and abilities. But I don't know. I've done a lot of babysitting in my time, and I have never seen a little girl with either the interest or the ability to put a donut on a doodle. That's it, friends. I'm done. It's particularly if you have children, this means if it's at all possible, get them out of the public schools, which are really indoctrination centers.
is if you ask the gender scholars, their solution for them is that, well, it's something to do with masculinity. We have to change boys' masculinity. And for years, there were efforts. It was actually kind of sad, I mean, because the boys would not cooperate, but there were these massive efforts to make the boys play more like girls. Back with the project. Some more news and Sweden has gone to extremes to encourage sexual equality from an early age. It's opened the gender neutral preschool Agalia in Stockholm, which bans the words him and her and doesn't allow toys or books that create a gender stereotype. Stay calm, Steve. Kitty Flanagan <laughs> joins us now from Sydney. Tell me, little lady, do you think we need more of this sort of thing in Australia? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I do, Charlie, because forget about building sites and the Defence Force Academy. Kindergartens are your hotbed of sexism. <laughs> and if you don't believe me, then allow me to quote Garner Casper. No, he's not a philosopher. He's a boy I went to kindy with, and he said, Boys are strong like King Kong. Girls are weak. Chuck them in the creek. <laughs> to my face, he said that. To this day, I still can't walk past a body of water without thinking, man, I am weak. I should be chucked in there. <laughs> that sort of thing wouldn't happen at Agalia. They've banned the use of the words boys and girls. Instead, they use the word friends, something they also do in Queensland. No matter what your gender, they just call you mate. G'day, mate. How are you, mate? I'm good, mate. But it goes further at Agalia. They also don't use him, her, he or she. Well, that's dumb. Soon Sweden will be full of children who don't know how to use personal pronouns. They'll be saying, Jürgen was running and then it fell over and hurt its knee. <laughs> Can't talk like that. It's rude. <laughs> Listen, excuse me, Charlie, can you ask Dave if it has a question for me? Um, I don't know. D does it? It does. Uh, so, Kitty, what about nursery rhymes? I mean, I can't imagine these kids are allowed to tell Polly to put the kettle on, yeah? No, you're right. Way too sexist. In the same way that when Wee Willy Winky runs through the town, they no longer mention his Wee Willy or, indeed, his Winky. Instead, there's a lot of focus on books that include gay, lesbian, bisexual and transgender people. One Projekt som fick 11 miljoner från Vetenskapsrådet vid Uppsala universitet. Det är en kvinna som heter Margreta Falgren och hon är såklart föreståndare för Centrum för genusvetenskap. Men hon har också påtänkt som rektor för Uppsala universitet väldigt snart. Det är inte säkert att det blir hon men sannolikheten är väldigt stor. Och då har hon fått en beviljad ansökan på nästan 11 miljoner för tvärvetenskapliga forskarmöten. Och då skriver hon så här i projektansökan. Det senaste decenniets utveckling vad gäller förståelsen av sex, gender inom naturvetenskap respektive genusvetenskap är i mångt och mycket till synes motstridiga, vilket skapar ökade spänningar mellan forskningsområdena. Vi vill ta dessa spänningar och konflikter på allvar, problematisera dem och undersöka möjligheterna till kunskapsutveckling genom överskridande av ämnesgränser mellan natur- och kulturvetenskaper. Naturvetare kan vara ovana vid vetenskapsteori och kritik. Och frågan är inför varför och hur ett genusperspektiv på naturvetenskaplig forskning ska kunna anläggas. Och det här har alltså Vetenskapsrådet beviljat 11 miljoner. Va? Hon kanske blir rektor för Uppsala universitet. Ja, jag var ju lektor där i höstas. Jag hade ett lektorsvikariat där i höstas.
viktigaste. Det viktigaste. Jag kanske själv väl vill gå på teatern eller inte. Mm. Men däremot tycker jag det är fel om man ska tvinga elever att gå dit. Paula? Alltså jag, skulle, jag skulle tycka det var väldigt roligt om denna rörande omsorg om ungas väl och ve kunde riktas lite grann mot det kvinnor utsätts för i all populärkultur. They run off every day to be indoctrinated by a public school system that tells them that they need to calm down and sit down and shut up, not take the lead. How dare you display energy of any sort? Man, man inbillar alla barn att de är offer för struktur och offer för något annat. Man
a large majority of them, girls were ahead of boys. And they concluded, quote, there is evidence that the female advantage in school performance is real and persistent. Now, what are their findings? The National Association of Education Progress provides a very objective picture of how kids are doing. And what you find is there has been for years a large and growing gap favoring girls in reading and writing. And that gap, either it's, very, it's as large as it's ever been, and in some cases it's, it's larger than writing is concerned. Um, the average 15-year-old boy writes like a 13-year-old girl. And um, if you look at honors classes, valedictorians, who's winning all the prizes, it's girls, girls, girls. According to the college board, girls now take more honors math and science programs. They are 54% girls, 46% boys. And then you get out of the math and science, and it's just girls prevail. Uh, something like English and foreign language, it's 61%, uh, 62% female. What about college? U.S. Department of Education t data show that today 50% of the bachelor's degrees, 59% of master's, and 50% of doctorates go to women. And according to the, their projections, by 2020, this college gap favoring girls is going to become a chasm. That if current trends continue, the last male will graduate from college in 2068. <coughs> now, so what is the government doing? We have this gap. Uh, it's growing. There has been a massive and much celebrated effort to strengthen girls in math and science in all areas. We had you know, massive numbers of self-esteem programs. We took our daughter to work. Everybody read Reviving Ophelia. Uh, and it, 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 girls were classified in the mid-90s as an underserved population. And we passed the Gender Equity Act, um, which counted them as discriminated against minority. So anyway, millions and millions of dollars have been spent to improve girls' achievements. Where are the dollars for boys, for the reading gap, the writing gap, the college attendance gap, the I don't care about school gap? Far more boys than girls from the earliest age just don't care about it. And it's very hard. It's an art to interest the typical little boy in school. 1970, 1980, they're equal in number. And then the women start going they, uh, this upward trajectory, and the men just go nowhere. Do you shut up, shut your doors, and declare victory and go home? That isn't what happens. The, the AAUW, if anything, the American Association of University of Women, is angrier today than ever. Their polemics, their language, their rhetoric. I'll quote them in a minute. You'll see for yourself. Boys in all groups uh, are at greater academic risk, but they get very little attention. Now, as I said, not everyone agrees with my analysis. Uh, some say the problem is manufactured. It's part of a continuing backlash against women and girls. Um, I don't know what would count as evidence. A friend of mine once said uh, that, you know, colleges are, you know, 60% women. What if they become 70%? What if there are no men at all? Will that be fair? Will that finally be fair? And they, you know, because our colleges now are 60% women, and by all projections, it's going, this is going to grow. 57 to 60 to 65 on many college campuses. But they still have women's centers where women are treated as the, the oppressed sex. If you look at a school like Bloomsburg State University, which is largely uh, students from the white uh, working class, it's, uh, I think the graduating class last year was 61% female. Something is wrong here. Um, and the question is, what can we do about it? Now. One thing I will tell you is if you ask the gender scholars, their solution for them is that, well, it's something to do with masculinity. We have to change boys' masculinity. And for years there were efforts. It was actually kind of sad, I mean, because the boys would not cooperate, but there were these massive efforts to make the boys play more like girls. Unge velger mer tradisjonelt i dag enn for 15 år siden. Ja, det er det som er paradokset, ikke sant? Det er rart. Veldig rart. Det er jo et mysterium. Og jeg tenker, hadde jeg hatt forklaringen på det, det. Myndighetene har i flere år forsøkt å rekruttere mannlige sykepleiere og kvinnelige ingeniører. Kristin Mile har jobbet som likestillingsombud, og hun har opplevd at disse tiltakene egentlig ikke har forandret så mye. Du får en sånn kanskje en, ett års eller to års effekt, og så dabber det liksom av igjen. Så hvorfor er det sånn? 
La oss først utelukke noen forklaringer. Det er ikke diskriminering som sånn? Nei, det tror jeg ikke er så mye av. Tidligere barne- og likestillingsminister Anniken Wittfeldt kan avkrefte at dette handler om at jentene er dårligere naturfag. Jentene gjør det bedre enn gutter i alle fag unntatt gym. Så hvorfor er det så få damer som vil jobbe med ingeniørfag og teknikk? Hvilke kjeder? Men vil også jobbe med sånn datating og lage noen systemer. Det er jo en faglig utfordring det også. Ja, men det er ikke så spennende som å møte mennesker i hverdagen og prate. Hvis man behandlet gutter og jenter likt fra starten av, så ville de få like interesser også. Ja? Ja, det blir jo på en måte implikasjonen av det jeg sier. På en måte implikasjonen av det jeg sier. På en måte implikasjonen av det jeg sier. Hvis gutter og jenter hadde blitt møtt med like forventninger, så ville forskjellene interesser forsvinne også. Tenker du at... Dette er så plastisk at du kan finne samfunn hvor ting er byttet om? Altså, det er, mener jeg, en grunnlære, mener jeg nesten også, ikke sant? Men vi er, som du sier, plastiske og bevegelige. Det er ingen grense for hva menn kan gjøre eller kvinner kan gjøre i forhold til det som er det viktige, nemlig oppførsel, emosjonalitet, adferd, evner vi har. Bjørg, Grandi og Signe er sveisere på Rosenberg Verft i Stavanger. Ja, det er klart. Kvinner og menn kan gjøre hva som helst, hvis de virkelig vil. Jeg drar til Arbeidsforskningsinstituttet og møter forskningsleder Katrine Egeland, som har skrevet flere forskningsrapporter om menn og kvinners yrkesvalg. Ofte så leser man populærvitenskapelige resultater at menns hjerne er sånn, kvinners hjerne er sånn. Hva tenker du om det? Eh... Det vet jeg ikke. Jeg vet ikke om det er enig i det. Men det er påfallende hvor interessert man er i å finne den type forskjeller. Du er ikke så interessert i den type forskjeller? Nei, nei. Veldig lite interessert i det. Så det er ikke relevant å se på sånne hjerneforskjeller for å forstå hvorfor menn oftere blir ingeniører og kvinner oftere blir i omsorgsyrker? Nei, det synes jeg ikke. Eller det... nei. Hei, bra. Hei, hei. Fast håndtrykk. Detektivarbeidet fører meg videre til kjønnsforsker Jørgen Lonsen ved Senter for tverrfaglig kjønnsforskning ved Universitetet i Oslo. Når man leser sånn om undersøkelser at menn og kvinners hjerner er ulike, hva tenker du da? Da tenker jeg at det er gammeldags forskning. Mesteparten av den type forskning er også tilbakevist i senere undersøkelser. De fleste snakker ikke sånn lenger om at hjernen er skrudd sammen på forskjellige måter. Forskjellen mellom gutter og jenter er egentlig bare kjønnsorganet? Nei, altså bryster og hår og høyde og muskelmasse og en del andre ting, ikke sant? Men alt utenom det da, er ingen forskjell. Følelser? Emosjonalitet, ja. Interesser? Interesser, intelligens, altså kapasitet. Er likt? Ja, er i utgangspunktet likt, ja. Norske kjønnsforskere tror ikke medfødte kjønnsforskjeller er relevant for å forstå hvorfor gutter og jenter er interessert i litt forskjellige ting. Men, jeg lurer på, hvis vi er født like, hva da med undersøkelsen til Camilla Skreiner? Det viser jo at kjønnsrollemønseren sitter ganske sterkt blant barn og unge fremdeles. Lonsen mener at gutter og jenter tar opp i seg omgivelsens forventninger til hva gutter og jenter skal gjøre. Altså man håndterer gutter og jenter systematisk forskjellig fra dag igjen. The more you free people in society, the more you open opportunities for people to do anything they want, the more likely it is that any kind of genetic predisposition they have will be able to express itself. In the, in the gender egalitarian countries like Norway, you really are free to follow your inclinations. You, you know, in, in a poor country, you're probably worried just about getting a job. You just want a job. And if, if it's computers that are going to get you that job, in India, for example, you'll go for it, even if you're a woman. But, you know, in, in gender egalitarian countries, North America and Europe, I think people feel freer just to pursue what they're truly interested in. And my point is, men and women 
are interested in somewhat different things. Kanskje er dette løsningen på likestillingsparadokset? I et fritt og likestilt samfunn vil menn og kvinner bli ulike fordi de får anledning til å dyrke sine særegne interesser. Før jeg drar hjemme til Norge, lurer jeg på hvordan Ann Campbell vil reagere på kjønnsforsker Jørgen Lornsens teorier. Så forskjellen mellom gutter og jenter er egentlig bare kjønnsorganet. Altså, alt som ikke har med det reproduktive systemet å gjøre, for å si det sånn da. Det er ikke bare den der nede. Hva da? Alt utenom det? Nei, altså bryster og hår og rydde og muskelmasse og en del andre ting, ikke sant? Men alt utenom det da, er ingen forskjell. Følelser. Emosjonalitet, ja. Interesser. Interesser. Intelligens, altså kapasitet. Er likt. Ja, er i utgangspunktet likt, ja. Amazing. Absolutely amazing. I'm astonished that someone could say that. I, I guess the question I would pose is, where do bodily differences come from? Where do the differences between men and women's reproductive systems come from? Evolution, I'm sure, would be the answer that most social scientists would give. And what orchestrates those bodily differences? What is responsible for the production of hormones and peptides that keep everything going? The human brain, mostly, yes, through feedback systems. It seems to me quite extraordinary that you could imagine that evolution has operated on the reproductive systems and has had absolutely no effect at all on our brain, the single most expensive organ that we have in the body. Thank you very much. This is very, very, very interesting. Um, maybe we're going to show uh, some of these clips to Norwegian researchers. Ah, and get to them see. to react. Yeah, yes, exactly. Yes, In yeah. an endless... Uh... Yeah, an endless cycle of reflection. <laughs> oh, they'll go mad. Some of the things I'll be like, wow, they'll go absolutely crazy. Det de engelske forskerne sier er jo åpenbart veldig på kollisjonskurs med det de norske kjønnsforskerne påstår. Så nå gleder jeg meg veldig til å dra tilbake til Norge igjen og høre med de norske kjønnsforskerne hva de mener om disse funnene. Først møter jeg forskningsleder på Arbeidsforskningsinstituttet, Katrine Egeland, og viser henne Simon Barons forskning på nyfødte. Og jeg forteller henne om Trond Dieseths studier som viser at gutter og jenter foretrekker forskjellige leker allerede ved ni måneders alder. Hva tenker hun om Dieseths funn? Jeg tenker at når han observerer dette her, så ser han det han er litt ute etter. Han er ute etter at det er kjønnsforskjeller og at de er medfødt. Ok, så han finner det han leter etter på en måte? Ja, det tror jeg igjen, ja. Jeg synes det er interessant å se hvor mye energi man kan bruke på å prøve å forklare. For eksempel sånn som kjønnsforskjeller, biologisk. Men jeg føler at disse sier jo det er et element av biologi her, og selvfølgelig samfunn og kultur, mens du er bare på samfunn og kultur. Ja. Og når du ser den forskningen på en dag gamle babyer, om det forandrer deg ditt syn på at likebehandling av gutter og jenter ville føre til at de får like interesser? Nei, det endrer ikke på det. Nei. Nei. Hva er på en måte det vitenskapelige grunnlaget ditt for å si at biologi ikke spiller noen rolle når det gjelder menn og kvinners ulike yrkesvalg? Mitt vitenskapelige grunnlag... Jeg har nok et ganske, det du ville kalle, en daglig veldig teoretisk utgangspunkt. Altså, biologi får liksom ikke plass der for meg. Altså, det vil... Og jeg synes nettopp at samfunnsforskning skal utfordre tenkning som baserer seg på at forskjeller mellom mennesker er biologiske. Er det samfunnsforskningens oppgave å utfordre biologisk tenkning? Bør ikke forskning heller prøve å finne ut hvorfor ting er som de er? Er det ikke en fare for at Egeland bare ser det hun er ute etter, hvis hun på forhånd har bestemt seg for at biologien ikke har noen betydning? Hva med forsker på Senter for tverrfaglig kjønnsforskning, Jørgen Lornsen? Synes han dette er noe interessant? Amazing. Absolutely amazing. I'm astonished that someone could say that. Det som jeg synes er fascinerende med denne vitenskapen, 
det er jo hvorfor er de så opptatt av å prøve å finne det biologiske opphavet til kjønn? Altså, hvor, hvorfor er de så frenetisk opptatt av kjønnsforskjellene? Men når du sier at det ikke er noen medfødte forskjeller mellom jenter og gutter som forklarer deres ulike interesser, hva baserer du det på? Eh, altså, jeg må jo forholde meg til vitenskapen, ikke sant? Jeg skal prøve å si noe om hvordan ting er og hva som henger sammen her. Mm. Og så, så langt så har ikke vitenskapen klart å vise at det er en genetisk opphav til kjønnsforskjeller. Nei, det vet Utover det som er med det reproduktive systemet. Det, 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 ja. Nei, for du, ja. du anerkjenner jo ikke de, at de undersøkelser her på en måte viser det på... Og det er på en måte ja, greit, men... Fordi de har en missing link. Harald, de har en missing link. Ja, men hvordan vet du at det ikke er noe medfødt da? Det er det jeg ikke forstår. Nei, men jeg sier at det, i det øyeblikket de klarer å vite... Ja, men vise, du må jo ha jo ja. sagt at, du, at det ikke er noen uh, viktige medfødte ja. forskjeller når det gjelder følelser, interesser, sånne ting. Hvordan vet du at det ikke er noe... Nei, la oss si det sånn at min hypotese er at det ikke er noen forskjeller. Vitenskapen har ikke bevist at det er noen forskjeller, ikke sant? Og da må jeg jobbe ut fra den, det kunnskapsnivået. Altså, men, du baserer du, men du antar at det ikke er noen forskjeller inntil det motsatte er bevist, på en måte? For eksempel, ja. Mm. Ja, men det er, det er interessant. Og dette er ikke noen gode peker, ikke den dette retningen? Dette er svak, <laughs> vil jeg kalle svak forskning, ja. Jeg vil det. Ja, er alt det de andre gjør svak forskning? Jeg spør meg, hadde Lornsen syntes dette var like svakt hvis det passet bedre med hans teorier? Lornsen sier at de andre forskerne er frenetisk opptatt av å finne biologiske årsaker til kjønnsforskjeller. Men jeg oppfattet ikke dem som så veldig frenetiske. De mente jo ikke at alt handlet om biologi. Tvert imot, da var de norske kjønnsforskerne som mente at ingenting handlet om biologi. Hvorfor er de så skråsikre? Og er det så farlig om det er noe biologisk her? Men viktigst, kan man som forsker virkelig forstå verden hvis man ikke tar alle muligheter i betraktning? Det er en veldig moderat proposal å si at det er en mixture av biologi og kultur. Jeg sier ikke at det er alle biologi, jeg sier bare at man ikke forstår om biologi. Problemet er at her i Sverige og i Vestlandet har man lykkes liksom hjernetvetta folk og så her og få tyst på folk. I Østeuropa så vet folk at alt det her er bare bluff og bog og skit, men de vil gjerne ha EU-pengene. Så man lykkes ändå. Så er det. Så man får angripa det på olika sätt beroende på vilket land man befinner sig i då. Så ja, man måste ta hänsyn till den rådande mentaliteten och Sverige är ett ganska extremt fall så det gäller att gå sakta fram. Men We have done away with male role models in the elementary school system. Fathers get routinely screwed over in custody cases. And thanks to ye olde sperm bank, women can make a conscious de decision to render fathers obsolete too. Indeed, a woman needs a man like a fish needs a bicycle.
Vissa män är så pass förtryckta så de knappast själva vet om det. Jag tycker jämställdhet är bra. Det är klart att alla vill ha jämställdhet. Och så vågar man inte säga nej. För att om man säger nej till något som har med genus att göra, då blir det att ah, du, du är mot jämställdhet. Och så Sometime in their life will be a victim of domestic violence. You don't, you don't What Theresa May is not saying to that. is one in four will women and one in six men. Two women die every week. So they need to be separated for both parties. But one woman, parties. one man dies. Well, the... You had to leave the country for quite a long time, didn't you? Well, because what I'm saying now, I, there were huge pickets against me. And I was threatened, yes, for daring. This is a million dollar industry, domestic violence. And the women who control it are not about to let any kind of evidence in that's going to take away the money. What do you mean by that? They're not going to share the money with anybody. Well, why do you describe it as a million dollar industry? Because it is. It's, uh, you In know, what the, way? the National Federation of Women's Aid gets something like 12 million from the government, let alone all the rest of it. It's so a, you're saying they're manipulating the government? Yeah, and continue. what they always have. This was, this was hijacked in 1974. And what I'd said from the very beginning, which is that it isn't a gender issue, it's an issue of learned pattern of behavior in childhood, was actually superseded by a very highly efficient machine called the feminist movement, which simply claimed it's what all men do to all women. So you're suggesting that generally women are manipulating the system in order Yeah, because everybody knows, and the figures have been there for years, the worst violence is between two women. Okay. Thank you very much indeed, Aaron Pizzi. Thank you.
Under senare år har Rocks uppnått status av en organisation få politiker vågar ifrågasätta. Huvudkontoret i Stockholm har framgångsrikt lyckats föra ut bilden av Rocks som den främsta experten på våld mot kvinnor. En uppgift som kommer härifrån har stor chans att snabbt bli en sanning. Jag upplevde otroliga hatet gentemot män och vad män står för. Så vi är verkligen en kamporganisation och vi är en opinionsbildare och vi är en feministisk rörelse som inte tänker tystna. Jag upp och sjungit Häng alla männen och Döda alla männen och där jag gick ifrån och var djupt chockad alltså. Det finns en sån tudelad uppfattning att kvinnor, kvinnor är bra och män är dåliga. Man ska tro på kvinnor men inte på män. Alltså en svartvit. Lite biologisk inställning. Klaringen är alltid att männen är överordnade kvinnorna. Att bekämpa alla analyser som inte ligger i linje med detta könsmaktsperspektiv är för Rox något av det viktigaste i den feministiska kampen. 1998 utsågs Margareta Winberg till jämställdhetsminister och det blev hennes uppgift att komma vidare i arbetet mot kvinnomisshandel. Rox och regeringen var överens om att männens makt är orsak till våldet och måste bekämpas. Och med Margareta Winberg som ordförande fick Rox chansen att flytta fram sina positioner och se till att rådet utgick från deras perspektiv. Margareta Winberg var väl införstådd. Män vill ha makt över kvinnor. Och mäns våld mot kvinnor är ett uttryck för att ha och bibehålla denna makt. We need to look at a therapeutic approach to domestic violence because it's not what we generally think which is patriarchy what all men do to all women majority of men do not lift a finger to women. What this is is a learned pattern of childhood if you're born and raised in a violent family this is how you know to behave. Whether it's boys or girls. Suggest... Är det ett krig? Ja, det tycker jag. Ibland kan jag säga så här att det här är ett, vi har ett inbördes världskrig. Och det är ett könskrig. Nu ska vi göra det här, när man känner så där ibland, ni vet. Men vi har ändrat oss lite och så sa vi till slut så här... Mm, mora knivar skulle det kunna vara något man kan dela ut. Nej, det är ingen bra idé. Men nu satt vi här och lekte lite sax. Sen kan man göra vad man vill med dem. Klippa papperstockor eller... Lorena Bobbitt, whose initial statement to police according to the New York Times was He always have orgasm and he doesn't wait for me to have orgasm. He's selfish. I don't think it's fair, so I pulled back the sheets and then I did it. She was hailed as a national folk hero, an obviously terrorized battered woman striking back at her oppressor. Never mind that there was plenty of evidence of reciprocal violence in that relationship. Never mind that he was in the process of leaving her and that they'd been discussing a divorce. The feminist narrative reared its ugly head before any of the details were known, and the case was crammed into that model in the public consciousness complete with a rape accusation that could not be proven in a court of law, and a story that repeatedly changed gears from Bobbitt's initial statement onward to fit the dogma of a domineering abusive husband and terrified cowed wife. Before she'd even cried abuse, the feminists of North America picked her up on their shoulders, a display of sisterly solidarity with a violent offender that culminated in carnival-style demonstrations outside the courtroom including the dispensing of cocktail wieners slathered in ketchup, t-shirts extolling the sweet virtues of revenge, and feminists selling buttons nominating Lorena Bobbitt for Surgeon General. Mainstream magazines hailed her as a feminist heroine, and perhaps most disturbing, a major feminist group in Ecuador, Bobbitt's home country, not only bankrolled her defense, but threatened to castrate a hundred innocent American men if she went to prison for mutilating her husband. Now, I don't see any misandry in any of that, or any kind of violent sentiment, or even terrorist leanings, at all. Do you? No. I mean, feminists must be super aware of uh, hatred and violence and terrorism, since I've been warned by well-meaning feminists that supporting men who go their own way is an act of terrorism. 
because MRAs sometimes use harsh or colorful language when discussing the subject. So I'm sure the vast majority of prominent feminists loudly and firmly condemned that group in Ecuador for the terrorists they are, and admonished the movement as a whole for associating with such groups. Oh wait, never mind. Det är fest i riksorganisationen för Sveriges kvinnojourer och det finns mycket att fira. När lusten faller på, jag hatar dig du jävla man, du tror du vet, du tror du kan. Allt om kvinnor, allt om våra liv, men du vet inget, du tar ett jävla kliv. Snubbe, gubbe, jävla man, bäst du börjar springa för här ser du en kvinna som hatar dig så mycket vi ska slita dig i stycken. I, I just, I, I don't get it. I don't. It's, it's ridiculous. I feel like I'm living in a parallel universe. I feel like every single time I talk to feminists about this issue, I'm having an out-of-body experience. That is how bizarre their minds seem to work. I, 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 I'm starting to think that the psychiatric community needs to include feminism in their big compendium of mental disorders because this is it, it seems to be based entirely on delusion so I just yeah I find it nearly impossible to believe a movement for women's rights which sounded so noble and lofty 40 30 even 25 years ago has turned so ugly, vindictive, and downright destructive. Feminists have completely turned the concept of equality on its head to where it now means discrimination and preferential treatment. George Orwell would be very proud. And then Organiserat verksamhet omkring sexuell övergrepp och rituell övergrepp, det är inte jag i tvivl om. Och att 
detta ofta också är er kopplat till kriminaliserad verksamhet, pornografiska framställningar, vapensmuggling och en del såna kombinationer. Det är er jag också helt övertygad om. Och og också att det är er ett mycket större fenomen än det annars. Det... Men det som är er riktigt illa och tänka på omkring detta, det är er ju alla de unga människorna och barn som är er involverade i detta här. So let's talk to Karen Rosander, a spokeswoman for the Swedish Prosecution Authority, joins us on the line from Stockholm. Good to have you on this news hour. How is it possible that such a serious mistake with the, the defamation implications it has on Mr. Assange was made? Uh, you co- can't call it mistake because the prosecutor in question has to, to make decisions on uh, the information available at the moment of decision and uh, um, all the investigations develop, of course. And yesterday, the new prosecutor had more information than the first prosecutor had the previous afternoon. Then it was a little bit um, early to issue an arrest warrant, was it not in the first case, if you didn't have enough information? She had information, but there was more information on Saturday and the prosecutor has to make decisions very quickly sometimes uh, on serious uh, crimes. So a mistake was made because not enough information was there or it was wrong information? I can't give any details on what kind of information there was but uh, it's it's a normal procedure that uh, an investigation gets more information during, well, more information for every day what do you make of the suggestion from a number of people that this is part of a campaign to smear Julian Assange? I think it's uh, quite natural that, that these uh, rumours <laughs> uh, happen in a, very, in a very famous case like this, and I'm not surprised at all. So you think it's a justified claim? What? What is? The fact that people are saying that he's been deliberately smeared, that he's been put up as some kind of scapegoat because of the work he does. I've no idea. Have you spoken to him? No. Any idea where he is? No. Are you looking for him? Uh, not at the moment, and the prosecutor in question uh, doesn't know yet whether she wants to, to interview him or not. Uh, she will decide on that matter later. Well, surely it would be the first step to try and contact the person who's at the centre of such an allegation, whether it turns out to be uh, baseless or whether, in fact, it has some uh, basis in fact. Surely the first step is to try and contact the person who's been accused. I can't give you any details concerning the investigation. Uh, Wouldn't it be logical to try and talk to him? Uh, I can't comment on that. Unfortunately. you feel a bit embarrassed by all of this? Oh, no, not at all. That's not the question. Why not? Because this is a normal procedure. Well, it's quite normal to accuse somebody of rape and then two hours later to say, no, it's not the case. It, yeah, it, it is quite common that, that new information gets into a case and they do have to revive earlier decisions. Okay, just one final question. There, there, were, there were two accusations. One was rape. You now say that yeah. that's not being investigated. But the, the sexual molestation, uh, yeah. what 
what's happening there? What was the incident as well? Uh, the prosecutor will look into that, uh, or into that matter, and we'll make a decision later this week. All right, thanks very much indeed, Karin Rosanda, uh, talking to us from Stockholm. <coughs> It was actually academics, university lecturers, um, young women students was the beginning of the women's movement. The most successful part of it is that at that point in the, in the 70s, if you think about it, the majority of women who were journalists internationally were very heavy radical feminists. So they had the women's pages and of course male journalists and male editors seeing it as in quotes a woman's problem left it to them and very quickly there was a savage kind of censorship and anybody who dared argue was in very serious trouble. They were very very highly organized Marxist groups of women of one sort or another. Uh, when I remember being horrified when I saw them storming the Miss World competition thinking to myself how can these women talk about liberation for women and su women supporting each other and then go and bully a section of other women that they don't like because they're doing something they don't approve of. And outside, and this is in the, the press cuttings, there were huge demonstration with banners and on the banners it said all men are bastards, all men are rapists. And I asked the police, I went down and said to the police, if that was black men or Jews, you'd arrest those women. But why don't you... Re <laughs> they just look very uncomfortable. And one of them said, we're frightened of them. Over the 12 years that I was running the refuge, if I went to speak, there was screaming feminists outside. I tried to, to publish a book called Prone to Violence. We finally did get it published. But I had to have a police escort all around England, and there were death threats and bomb threats. And the final moment came for me after struggling for all those years. Uh, when the bomb disposal unit came to my house because there was a suspect package and said everything that came to me had to go to them first because they were concerned about my safety and the safety of my family. And that's when I left England and went into exile for something like 15 years.
pjäsen är om män för kvinnor. Vissa humorlösa människor tar ju det här extremt bokstavligt. Det är faktiskt en stor del av verkligheten vi beskriver. Och, den, och den, den, är en slags, den tar tillbaka allt förtryck som kvinnorna har varit med i genom årtusenden. De har inte fått det är teaterpjäser hand. vi spelar, det är inte våra egna privata åsikter. Vad tror du gör dem så skräckslagna och upprörda? Jag vet inte. Jag tycker att det är ett tecken på den strukturen vi lever i. I was just thinking it might be useful to examine another famous shooter, one who went by the name of Valerie Solanus. For those of you who don't know, Solanus is the feminist author of the infamous scum manifesto whom many feminists, feminists today have tried to characterize as a satirical work, which is yet more revi revisionist history right there, but I'll get to that in a minute. Another feminist told me just the other day that it was, at its heart, entirely nihilistic, calling for the end of humanity altogether. Now, I found that really interesting since the manifesto actually calls for the systemic extermination of the male sex through violent rebellion on the part of women, after which said women could live the rest of their lives in peace, at which point why would any of them want to burden themselves with children? To conclude that the main point of the manifesto was some sort of egalitarian vision of nihilism with respect to humanity as a whole is basically equating the genocidal murder of males with the free choice on the part of women to not spoil their male-free utopian existence by having children. Solanus's other claim to fame was as the person who shot and nearly killed Andy Warhol. 
She actually attempted to kill three men that day. She shot Warhol and art maven Mario Amaya, an associate of Warhol's, and then put the gun against the head of Warhol's manager, Fred Hughes, at which point the gun jammed. If the gun hadn't jammed, I really don't see any reason to believe that three men would not have died that day. Not as well known to most is the fact that Warhol wasn't even the man Solanus had set out to kill that day. Her intended target was her publisher, Maurice Gerodias, or Gerodias, uh, whom she felt had wronged her. As a condition of him publishing the Scum Manifesto through Olympia Press, which he owned, he'd required her to give him the right of first refusal on all her future work. Uh, this is like a common clause in publishing contracts, and it just stipulates that the author will bring all future or all related work to that publisher first, at which point the publisher can offer for it or decline, and the author can accept the offer or negotiate better terms or decline altogether and offer it elsewhere. Um, it really does not give up any kind of control over an author's work. It just slows them down uh, as far as offering it elsewhere. Now, Ms. Solanus took this agreement to mean that Gerodia now owned the copyright to all her future works. Um, I mean, if the redundant and meandering and incoherent drivel of the manifesto itself isn't indicative of enough of this woman's level of crazy and stupid, the fact that she never bothered to ask anyone what that agreement meant, either before complying with it or after, or indeed before setting out to kill because of it, that should be evidence enough of some serious deficiencies on her part. Now, when Solanus went looking for Gerodia, he wasn't at his office. For whatever reason, she decided Warhol would be a suitable stand-in to vent her spleen at men, and claimed to police at her and at her hearing that Warhol, who had done nothing more than give her a couple of bit parts in two of his movies, had too much control in her life. Uh, she said he had her tied up lock, stock, and barrel, and was going to do something to her that would have ruined her. Um, so she's clearly, clearly delusional. At her hearing, she insisted she was right in what she did and had nothing to regret. Um, after some very much needed stints uh, in Bellevue Hospital for psychiatric evaluation, she pled guilty to reckless assault with attempt to harm and was sentenced to three years. She was reported at that time to be dedicating the remainder of her life to the avowed purpose of eliminating every single male from the face of the earth. And though she was aware of the feminist movement at the time, she considered them a uh, civil disobedience luncheon club. So, in essence, even the most radical second waivers weren't radical enough for Sol Solanus. Uh, they might hate men, they might want to liberate themselves completely from men, but they weren't prepared to eliminate all males from the face of the earth, at least not yet. So Solanus really had no time or patience for them. They were merely playing at being feminists. But as much as Solanus couldn't be bothered to associate herself with the radical but not radical enough feminists of the day, those feminists practically jumped at the chance to associate themselves with her once she flipped her nut and pulled a Sedini. Robin Morgan, a prolific feminist author who eventually became editor of Ms. Magazine, the most influential feminist rag there is, joined demonstrators demanding Solanus's release from prison. Ty Grace Atkinson, feminist author and then president of the New York chapter of Now, praised Solanus as the first outstanding champion of women's rights. Florence Kennedy, a lawyer and active member of Now who went on to found the Feminist Party and the Women's Political Caucus, called her one of the most important spokeswomen of the feminist movement. Wow. Du tycker det är okej okay att ni hyllar eh, en bok som säger att manlighet är en bristsjukdom och att mannen är en biologisk olycka? Fast jag vill inte kommentera det som det här är ju en insändare i tidningen. Jag vill, jag vill inte gå ut och kommentera och prata för hela rörelsen att den står under. Förstår du? Men i, den här, i er tidning ja. så, så har de hyllar ni upp det. det här manifestet som ja. säger att, ja. det, att, man, att män är djur och maskiner och vallen mm. dildos. Ja. Står du för det? Ja, det står jag för. Män är djur? Män är djur. Tycker inte du? Tycker inte du det?
men patriarkat är ju bara en feministisk floskel. Hur kan vi, hur kan vi till exempel... Och det, det är jobbigt att behöva erkänna för sig själv att jag ingår i en förtryckande struktur bara i egenskap av mitt kön. Mm. Det är inte så kul att fejsa det. Liksom. Om man letar med ljus och lykta så kan man hitta dolda maktstrukturer överallt. Jag, jag, kan, hitta på, jag kan hitta på maktstrukturer och, och hitta dem vad som helst om jag bara letar. Jag kan hitta dem i mitt skafferi om jag vill. Jag kan hitta dem i, i, i vilket litterärt verk som helst. Och, och, och fast litterär, det litterära verket handlar om något annat så kan jag få det till att... att det handlar om något som det inte gör. Liksom. Det kan man alltid göra tolkningar av saker. De har fått 40 000 kronor var, ungefär från Stockholms stad. Ja. Men det här att unga ska gå och kolla på det. Jag har ju själv varit lärare i mm. tio års tid och har just fått in på olika teater förbund runt om och det är alltid en avvägning vilka man säger ja till. Och jag skulle inte gå med mina elever, framförallt pojkar i åldern 16-18 och gå senare. Det krävs väldigt mycket som Andreas sa, förarbete och efterarbete om man ska ta till sig det här. Sen vet jag också att det är väldigt starka ord och varför ska mina 16 år höra att de är... Att de ska dödas, gasa sig. Det är ganska hårda ord för unga pojkar. Vi skulle det gå, säger jag, men det krävs väldigt mycket förarbete och efterarbete mm. för att få fram det. Och jag tror också att det kan, många unga män kan ta illa vid sig. Ja, det har ni ju funderat på säkert. Eh, ja, absolut. Ja. Först vill jag bara säga att eh, unga tjejer får ju utstå oerhört mycket. Det räcker att gå in och, och köpa en Coca-Cola i en affär. Du tycker inte alla män så, så, att, så, så, så tittar på en massa liksom folktidningar. Lite... Men det släpper vi absolut. För shit, säger Det är staden! Vi var inte fejt och jag släpper! Ja, Valerie Solanas kompromisslösa uppgörelse med det patriarkala samhället provocerar. Skam har sagt stå för Society for Cutting Up Men, vilket ungefär betyder sammanslutning för att skära upp män. Och manifestet tolkas av en del som en text som argumenterar för kvinnans frigörelse genom det manliga könets utplåning. Vad tror du gör dem så skräckslagna upprörda? Jag vet inte, jag tycker att det är ett tecken på den strukturen vi lever i. Om man letar med ljus och lykta så kan man hitta dolda maktstrukturer överallt. Med dem angrepp Steiners, med dess alls i Norden omkom. Man fyrer. Steiner... Steiner konnte nicht genügend kräfte för en angrepp massieren. Der angrepp Steiner ist nicht erfolgt. Juliette av Marquis de Sade som också spelas på Turteatern i höst och som även den är en pjäs om makt men skriven av en manlig extremist verkar däremot ha passerat utan särskilt starka reaktioner trots Regarding the feminist movement what does the slogan make the personal political mean to me well, that that i always hated that slogan what it really means is you take your personal damage and one of the things that's very obvious in those very early days of the women's movement how many of the radical women leaders of the movement themselves had really disturbed backgrounds and were very very violent uh, and then you make that political so if my dad's a shit all men are shits if you say that you can do almost anything you like you can go from the personal and make it political. So what happened is sufficient group of women got together to complain bitterly. Because you have to remember the beginning of the feminist movement was a Marxist movement. It was women in the left of, of the politics in Britain who decided that they had had enough of working with men on the left and were going to have their own, in quotes, movement. Jag spelar en teaterföreställning, jag är en skådespelerska 
för att citera den manliga polischefen som han sa i Svenska Dagbladet. Det är tråkigt att människor i Sverige inte kan skilja på ett konstnärligt uttryck och en åsikt. Mm. Och det måste... sätt som man kanske nog inte förstår om man inte har blivit modotad. Intellekt sätt som man kanske nog inte förstår om man inte har blivit modotad. Intellekt Tagga ner och tugga i er. Jag tycker jag kommer från Moderata ungdomsförbundet mm, och även såklart. er. Men, men varför säger du så? Ehm... Tagga ner och tugga i er. Jag tycker jag kommer från Moderata ungdomsförbundet mm, och även såklart. er. Men, men varför säger du så? Jag tycker det finns en låg Ehm... Ja, Men det med skattepengar är ju oer oerhört intressant. Jag är ju fullständigt övertygad om att om en pjäs hade satts upp av en man som mm. på riktigt hade försökt döda tre kvinnor och därefter skrivit en bok som går ut på att alla kvinnor ska utplånas från jordens yta. Den pjäsen hade inte fått ett öre i skattepengar. Okay, det vet men den här inte, teatern men, har skattepengar vad? från kommunal nivå, från ja. landsting och från staten. Och per, bara för att det är så här. himla politiskt Tacka korrekt. Tacka Lofa, nu kommer den här mansfart. debatten fort. Den pjäsen hade inte fått ett öre i skattepengar. Okay, det vet men den här inte, teatern men... har... Our new book, The Flip Side of Feminism, exposes the lies about feminism and puts young women on guard so they will not be destroyed by feminist myths. Uh, feminism teaches women that they are victims of the patriarchy. This is so unfortunate. It's a recipe for being unhappy. Uh, Betty Friedan uh, said that the home was a comfortable concentration camp. And Gloria Steinem said, when you get married, you become a semi-non-person. Uh, the feminists were against marriage. Uh, they invited women to be independent, uh, to go out and have a career, and to avoid marriage. And that is just simply so unfortunate. The Flip Side of Feminism is a good book for both men and women, for mothers and fathers. It tells what conservative women already know, but most men don't dare to say.
And the reason is because it shows how the feminist movement has attacked men, how it's been disdainful, not only of full-time homemakers, but also of fathers. Uh, it is a very good book to give to your, the young people in your family so they will not be misled by the media or by academia or by the women's studies courses in colleges and universities. Feminists frequently ask me, uh, am I not grateful for all the opportunities that feminism has created for me? Uh, that's ridiculous because I made my way long before the feminist movement got started. Uh, I worked my way through a great university, Washington University in St. Louis, got my degree in 1944. I worked my way through as a gunner on the night shift, firing 30 and 50 caliber ammunition to test the ammunition before it was accepted by the government. I didn't need the feminists to get me that job. And actually, my mother got her college degree in 1920. Those opportunities were always out there for women if they wanted them. In previous generations, the majority of women just thought uh, building a family and being the mothers and homemakers uh, was more important. And then I published my first book, A Choice Not an Echo, in 1964 and uh, sold three million copies right out of my garage. I didn't need the feminists to do that. So they didn't create any opportunities for me. Those opportunities are always there for American women who are the most fortunate people who ever lived on this earth. Flipside is essentially asking people to rethink the way they've been taught to think. And that is a very tall order. But we can begin to sort of open the doors to another way of looking at this issue for the first time in Flipside. Obviously, but here's my, my two cents worth, my opinion. Women think that they want men they can control. And feminists know they want men they can control, uh, that they can dominate. The push is to criminalize patriarchy and uh, have a more matriarchal society. In order to do that, uh, they have to strip men of their importance, their ambition, their leadership abilities, and uh, instead instill those traits in females. Now the family is falling apart. Uh, there are more single mothers now than ever. Uh, even in the case of divorce, the wife generally gets the kids. Uh, that means that she has to take on the role of both mother and father. Now the average mother does not have some evil scheme to turn her son into a little girl but uh, she simply doesn't understand males, um, much less raising one to be a man. Try as they might, mothers do not make very effective fathers. Uh, that's a burden that neither she nor her son should have to bear. I'm saddened very much when I see, you know, anywhere I go, you see these single moms and uh, frustrated single moms uh, walking around with their, their little boys in tow, and they always look lost to me little boys. Um, there, there's not that strong male anchor in their life and the, the only influence in their life is is their mother, you know, as far as parenting goes. Um, in the absence of a close older male, um, a mentor and a role model, uh, as a result of this twisted arrangement, little boys grow up learning to think more like and identify more with females. So in that regard, it's simply a side effect of our messed up, hook up, shack up, break up culture. Now the feminist agenda, of course, is uh, much more sinister, uh, much more intentional in the feminization of males. It's about power, it's about female supremacy, and obviously their influence extends to more than single mothers. Um, it's infiltrated our media, uh, basically every facet of our culture, um, worst of all our educational system, heaven knows. If you can create a unisex society uh, in which males are of no particular advantage, no particular use, and there's supposedly nothing that they can do which females cannot, then they're of little use or importance, and uh, that's exactly how the feminists want them. Of course, I also believe that one of the main reasons for this uh, this prevalent attitude uh, within feminism is because the feminist agenda, as well as the homosexual agenda, by the way, is a tool of the socialist slash Marxist agenda, as I've said before, which aims to make males obsolete. Why? 
Well, the family unit is recognized um, even by communism as the foundation of a strong society. A strong family does not need the state, does not need the government. Uh, they can get by on their own. Strong parents raise their children how they want to raise them. For the state to be able to step in and control the family, especially the children via education, aka indoctrination, they have to destroy it first. They have to break it down. How better to break it down than to remove the traditional strong male head of home and create a vulnerable environment in which the family actually does need the state to survive. By the way, I'm sure you're very familiar with the book The War Against Boys by Christina Hoff Summers. I have yet to read the book, but uh, I'm really looking forward to it. It looks like an excellent book.